Welcome everybody to our ninth annual Research and Education Week. It is my great honor as the executive sponsor for nursing to welcome you all. Someone just commented to me, they were like, look at the auditorium full of all these nurses. Yes, you can count on us to, um, to, to show up in great number. And we're really, really pleased to see so many of you and so many of our colleagues here to help us again kick off our ninth annual Research and Education Week. I want to um, really give um, an acknowledgement again to all of you nurses who are here in the auditorium, many nurse leaders um, external to the organization who are either here or are joining us via WebEx. So we want to welcome all of you who are, have joined us virtually um, as well. Special thanks to our nurse planning committee who has planned an amazing week full of events um, beginning today, of course, with our keynote speaker. This is our sixth um, uh, year featuring a nurse scientist in nursing re in um, research and education week. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Joseph. And I have with me here today Dr. Pam Hines, who is our Director for Nursing Quality and Professional Practice in Nursing Science here at Children's. Importantly, holds our endowed chair for the William and Joanne Conway Endowed Chair for Nursing for Nursing Research, and um, she is going to kick us off with a formal introduction to our keynote speaker. Thank you. Greetings to all. I join Linda Talley's warm welcome to each of you to this amazing event. This is indeed my favorite week of the entire year, where annually we celebrate research in all its forms, as well as quality improvement science. And the words that you are about to hear from scientist Dr. Joseph will only add to this week. I'd like to share a little bit about her, if I may. First of all, Dr. Joseph represents the entire spectrum of what we call professional nursing. She did her licensed practical nursing and associate degree studies at Hospice Community College. She went on then to get her baccalaureate in nursing at the College of New Rochelle. Then she went on to get her master's degree serving as a family nurse practitioner at Pace University. And then to study nursing and genomics at the University of Pennsylvania. For two of the summers, while she was at her doctoral studies, she served as a fellow at NIH, again, pursuing her interest in genetics. And then she pursued a postdoctoral fellowship in the metabolism unit in the clinical and translational science unit there at NIH. And now she's the chief of the sensory unit, metabolism, and the behavioral clinical trials unit of the intramural research at the National Institute of Nursing Research. She's amazing. She has received multiple awards for being an innovator, a scholar. And in addition to that, she is the current 2019 recipient of the NIH Lasker Clinical Grant Award to study variations in taste and smell in obesity. How excellent is that? And in addition to that, she's a co-investigator of four other grant-funded studies about taste, gut to brain and brain to gut. Very exciting. Now, those, for those of us here who are all very committed to mentoring, there's an additional quality that I would like you to know about her, and that is she mentors at every level of degree granting program. Outstanding. But there's a couple more comments I'd like to share with you, and that is about her personal habits. <laughs> I would like you to know that she is a dancer. Take note, the tango. <laughs> playing violin, yoga, and mindfulness. Let's all welcome Dr. Polly Valerie Joseph to our podium. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hines, for the beautiful introduction. And 
thanks to those that are joining virtually from your office or from wherever you um, you join in today. So the title of my talk is "What Did Mary Poppins Know About the Science Behind That Spoonful of Sugar?" So it's a very interesting title, and I hope that throughout the presentation I'm able to answer that question. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So the objectives are to talk a little bit about the genetics associated with how children experience sweet and bitter taste and the implications for health, um, describe some of the chemosensory symptoms that are currently investigated by neuroscientists um, at NINR primarily since I coordinate that, that line of work, and describe the training opportunities at NINR and in my lab. So the mission of my lab is to advance knowledge for molecular and neuronal um, mechanisms that underline eating behavior, taste and smell variations in different metabolic conditions. So to do that, um, I primarily use what we call the NIH symptom science model in which we focus on complex symptoms in which I categorize complex symptoms as taste and smell, um, and then we phenotype do different phenotypic characterization, look at different biomarker discovery panels. So within the lab, we look at epigenomics, transcriptomics, microbiomics, metabolomics, and then develop different interventions and treatments that can help us manage um, changes in taste and smell. So one of the things that we know, and I think it's not um, novel to the audience, is that at least one in three kids is overweight or obese. Childhood obesity, is the number one concern for child health, child health and national security in America. And since 1980s, the rate of obesity has been increasing. And as we know, the cost, the medical cost is also increasing um, as when the rate. So what about taste and smell? So we know that taste and smell are chemical senses, are often very neglected senses. Most people study vision, hearing, but when it comes to taste and smell, really understudied. But if you think about it, we like to eat the food that we like, that we prefer, and if something doesn't smell very well, we probably try to avoid it. So there is a lot when the sense of um, the, this chemical sense is also when reward. So this is to set the stage that this is important. Plus I'm very passionate about it. So when we talk about taste, as we all know, we have the tongue, we have the taste papillae, and we have the taste receptors. And within the taste receptors, we have different presynaptic cells that will activate a specific stimulus. I like to put this picture here because I think probably most people in the audience have learned that we have taste, we're able to taste either sour in the sides or bitter in the back of the mouth. That's actually a mis it's a misrepresentation of the truth that is not true. We're actually able to taste everything throughout all of our tongues. This was a bad translation from a Japanese, from Japanese to English, just to let you know. <laughs> so when it comes to taste, we have different taste receptors and there's different ligands that actually activate those receptors. So we have the different types of taste, whether it's umami, sweet, bitter, sodium, sour, or carbonated um, beverages or cells. So those are activated by what we call heterodimers. So this would be like what for umami, the T1R plus the T1R3, which are like two genes come together and activate that receptor. So that's how you're able to taste umami. And umami, you will think of umami as soy sauce. And for sweet, there's also a combination of specific genes that come together to be able to allow to taste sweet. So whether it's sucrose, fructose, glucose, you name it. And when it comes to bitter, we have a huge family of bitter receptors, over 30 receptors, that are able to let us distinguish about different um, bitter compounds, whether that would be saccharide, what, what for some people they will consider like artificial sweeteners, sometimes they actually taste bitter, um, as well as PTC. And then we have sodium as well. In addition to that, we more, most recently we have fat taste um, as an additional taste. And 
the ligands that are activating that taste are still being studied, but these are some of the ones that are being mentioned in the, in the literature. Um, CD36 and CRPM5, and we're actually currently working a lot on this specific type of taste. However, we not only have taste receptors in the mouth, we also have taste receptors expressed in other areas of the body, the lungs, the gut, the bladder, um, the colon, the stomach, the testes. But what are these receptors doing and why, why are they there? So that's a question that actually my lab is very interested in studying and really trying to understand some of the current work that we have is really trying to understand the expression of the taste receptors in the brain as we give um, different types of diet. So there's a lot of questions to be investigated trying to understand what are these receptors doing. Um, as I mentioned, we have the taste receptors in the gut. One of the things that we know from the literature is that we have the SAS2R38, which is a bitter gene, is associated with glucose homeostasis. And then you have GINA3 that is involved with sweet taste variations and sweet taste perception. But what is the interaction? What is the signaling in the gut? How does that signal to the brain? And what are the metabolic implications of these receptors? We still don't know a lot of that. So like taste, we also have smell. And I'd like to explain this a little early in the talk, just because we have two different types of smell. We have what we call orthonasal olfaction, that you can think about getting a big burger and smelling it, and that's orthonasal olfaction. But we also have retronasal olfaction, and that's pretty much when you pinch no your, noise and your nose and you're not able to taste anything, but then after you release your nostrils, then you smell the food. And that happens after um, you actually con um, consume the food. Now, another script, um, thing that I would like to sort of um, put in early is that the difference between taste and flavor. Flavor is multisensory perception. So when flavor, you have taste, you have smell, you have trigeminal sensation, you have vision, and you have sound. So you have all of the different senses actually working to actually give you that sensation of flavor. And this is important because a lot of, when you ask patients, when patients are describing, oh, food doesn't taste the same anymore, is it taste, is it smell, or is it flavor? So those are the, um, the things that sometimes we need to think about. So how do we measure taste? So we have what we call taste preference, which is liking. So it's how much of a substance would you actually like. And then we have taste threshold, which refers to the minimum amount of a solution that you need to elicit a response to your sense of taste. And these two um, definitions are very important as I move on into the um, rest of the presentation. So what did Mary Poppins know? So it is true that you know, drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. So as so many of many times, as many of you in the audience probably know, like a lot of medications are actually coated with sugar to be able to make them more appealing, especially for kids. So in infancy, within hours of birth, infants exhibit a strong preference for sweet. So there is evidence that shows that, you know, they increase the intake for things that taste sweet, the, suck, the suckling pattern that they have, um, the different special expressions that you might see as you give a kid something that tastes sweet versus bitter, and also it blunts the expression of pain. And I think that's probably not novel for maybe nurses that work in the PQ that probably give children something sweet as they're given, used to give, at least when I used to work clinically, we used to give them something sweet and we used to give them their injections, and then that was sort of a way to minimize their pain. But what are the effects, especially when it comes to children that have chronic conditions in which they have rapid, like, continuous exposure to things that taste sweet, especially in a clinical setting? That has not been investigated. So more in terms of, like, sweet liking is inborn. 
so yeah, tracks predominantly um, taste quality of the human milk. So human milk is sweet. So from an evolutionary perspective, you can think of it is important for us to be able to taste sweet. It attracts sources of energy, and it's important, especially during periods of growth for children. So it is not bad. The issue is the environment that we live in. So we are able, and when older children, we're able to use sophisticated psychophysical tools to list the date, phenotypes and compare with older individuals. So we use what we call forced choice tracking procedures to determine the level of taste that is more preferred or that individ, um, individuals are able to perceive. And most of these methods have actually been published in the NIH toolbox. So it's available to anyone that's interested in doing these type of studies. So um, in the study that was done by um, Dr. Julie Manella out of the Monell Chemical Sciences Center where I trained, they looked at um, children prefer more intense sweetness. So you can see here how um, children compared to adults have higher preference for, for sweet, for things that taste sweet. So if you think of a can of soda, so that would be for children, they will have a can of soda plus seven more cubes of sugar. That's the equivalent of the amount of sucrose that they actually preferred. And these studies have been done repeatedly over the years with similar results. So again, just to illustrate, in there's 10 teaspoons of sugar in every 12 ounce can of Coke. That's a lot of sugar. So also children have higher bliss point for sweetness of fructose and some low calorie um, sweeteners. So you can see here for fructose, children again prefer um, higher concentration than adults, and it's the same here for sucralose, and those are, um, that's an artificial sweetener. However, this is not unique to the United States. This has been observed in studies that have been done in every other country in the world in which we measure um, the level of preferred sweetness among children. Um, in a study that was actually published last week that was conducted in Ghana, um, they measure again the sweet preference of, of children and they saw that um, the level of sweet that most preferred was similar among the young children living in Ghana and those living in Philadelphia. And both groups of children, level of most preferred was higher than adults in Philadelphia. And this paper was just published in uh, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition last week. So, but there is a point in which children start developing adult-like patterns for taste preference, and it's evident more so during mid-adolescence. So there's something that happens during mid-adolescence that actually kind of shifts um, in, um, individual differences when it comes to um, sweetness. So again, the level of sweetness most preferred has been positively related to the bio biomarker of bone growth. Um, so saying that it's important in terms of, um, of growth and development. However, like when it comes to um, obesity, there's this misconception of like obese children don't have higher bliss um, at the point of sweetness. And regardless of their body weight, children still prefer high levels of sweet compared to adults. And you can see that when you this graph, when we show, uh, this is probably a little bit hard to see, but this is all children, normal weight children and, and obese. And this again is in regards to preference. Then when it comes to the rewarding properties, this change when age. We know that um, in the extra dopamine receptor binding associates with age-related changes in the most preferred level of sweetness. And this is also true not only uh, in children but in adults, where you see older adults having a decreased preference for, um, for sweetness. 
the good news is that, again, the attraction for sweetness is a good thing because we want kids to be able to drink their mother's milk. It's rewarding to learn to like flavors paired with um, sweet taste. Um, it blunts, again, the expression of pain, and it blocks the bad taste. And this was a particular study um, that was reported by Forestell back in 2017, in which they gave the children sweet taste, sucrose in the left, and you can see the facial expression of the baby. And then, like, you have the bitter taste, and you can see then the facial expression of the baby. So you can see this thing from a very early um, age. And this was presented two hours after birth, before the first postnatal feed. Um, then children are attracted to taste um, signalists that um, call calories during the periods of growth, which I uh, mentioned earlier. And, but the, one, the bad news is that children are vulnerable to overconsumption when living in environments of sweetness. So sweetness used to refine sugars, um, fructose. So what the question is, how can we... I mean, it's like, how do we modify the environment? How do we modify the biology to be able to mitigate this high preference for sweet? So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, a study that um, was conducted about a few years ago. Um, so one of the things that we know is that people of all ages eat sugars in excessive amounts. And sugars have a powerful hedonic appeal, especially for children. And it's one of the primary culprits in children's diet, and that might be associated with the overconsumption of sweet tasting foods. So one of the things that we knew in the literature is that in adults, variation on those genes that I mentioned um, for sweet taste, SAS1 or 3 and GINA3, were related to sucrose taste sensitivity. In adults, the SAS1 or 2 was not gene um, related to sucrose taste sensitivity. However, in both adults and children, variation of the tas 2 r 38 gene, which is a bitter gene, was related to sweet taste preference and the sweetness of the most preferred beverage and cereal. Also, one of the things that I was very interested in was to look at the relationship between variations of the tas 1 r 2 tas 1 r 3 gina 3 and the tas 2 r 38 gene with sucrose detection threshold. And this had not been tested before. So that, if you remember, is the lower amount of substance that you need to elicit a response um, in the sense of taste. So I wanted to understand individual differences in sucrose taste detection threshold and their genetic basis in children. So for that study, we then recruited 235 children. Um, 30, 235 were consented, and then we had another 96 um, that had complete data when it came to sucrose detection threshold, genotype, waste to height ratio, calories, and added sugars. And out of the 235, 216 were able to complete the study. And then for about 19 of them, which is not a bad number, we were not able to get that measure. So children were between the ages of 7 to 14 years of age, or recruiting for the metropolitan Philadelphia area. And mothers self-reported the race and ethnicity of their child. So what we do, so this is pretty much the setup in the lab. So we, have, we do the Monel two alternative forced choice fair comparison tracking method. And this is for threshold, so not preference. So right here where you have the big bird is where the child will actually sit. And we do have this in the lab because we wanted the kids to feel acclimated and, and sort of um, understand what we were trying to do with them. And then we have all of these solutions. So what we do is that we give them a particular concentration of a solution and then water. And then we ask them which one has a taste. And so this is actually a quantitative method. So we start by a specific concentration and we do all of this elaborate procedure until we actually find the level of um, their threshold for that particular substance. So we do this for both salt, sweet, umami, um, so you name it, we're able to do this. And then in addition, we were able to get saliva for DNA, um, 
which were the ass we assay for specific um, genes. And these were the genes and the um, and the markers that we actually used. So all of which were associated either with sugar consumption, sweet taste sensitivity, or bitter taste sensitivity in the literature. So out of the 235, um, the average age was about 10. Um, about 50, almost 57 percent, 56, 58 percent of the kids were um, black or African American. Then, as I said, we had a percentage of kids for which we actually had additional measures, um, total calories and percent total calories as added sugars. So what we found, um, to my surprise, was that none of the sweet taste related genes were associated with sweet taste threshold. And I was very puzzled about this finding, so I kept doing the analysis all over again, and that was, that was the result. So, but we did find, and this was the first time we were able to find this, was that um, for the task 2 r 38 gene, the bitter gene, they were um, for all three um, SNPs that we actually looked at, they were associated with um, sweet taste threshold. So I was like, oh, maybe I made a mistake in the analysis. But no, it, that was actually true. And I'll show you a few additional data on that. Then we also saw that um, the diet of children with the better sensitive genotype contained more added sugars as a percent total, um, total calories than diets of children that had one or two copies of the other allele, so either A, B, or B, B here. So one of the thoughts is that maybe those children that are more bitter sensitive need more sugar to be able to mask their bitter, um, like their bitter taste. So that was one of the um, thoughts that we had. Um, just like it had been shown previously in the literature, boys had um, higher threshold than girls. We also saw that those that had more um, adiposity, a central adiposity, had um, lower detection threshold as well as for lower detection threshold for send body fat. Um, so these were very interesting studies. So a year later, this group from Italy actually repeated the study in a younger population in which they actually reported similar findings. So they reported the same findings when the task 2 r 38 gene being associated with um, sweet food intake in children. So that was, that was very exciting to see the replication being done. Then um, more recently, I think that was um, two years ago, there was also another study by Sini et al. in which they show Supra threshold measures of taste perception in children being associated with dietary quality and body weight um, in children. So that was, um, again, very exciting to see the replication of, of those adult regional data. So these went on to, to be picked up and by, by the media in many different ways, um, just because it was the first time that we were able to show that relationship between bitter sensitivity and sweet taste threshold, or sweet and sensitivity. So what are the, um, so the implications, um, so this, as I said, it points out to the role of the bitter taste receptor gene um, in sweet taste perception, suggesting that sweet and bitter taste system might be more linked than we actually thought. And whether the bitter taste receptor genotype or the sweet taste threshold associated with excessive intake of added sugar or deposit requires additional studies, some of which are being conducted in the previous lab where, where I actually did some of this work. However, um, studying taste and smell is just um, also important if, when we think about precision nutrition as a goal to improve health and health outcomes. There, not sure if people in the audience were able to see the strategic plan for NIH nutrition research that came out in December of last year, in which there was mention in terms of sensory nutrition, 
and some like studying taste and smell as um, really trying to understand preferences and um, so on and so forth. So, but what are the implications for practice? I mentioned a little bit in terms of like studying taste in regards to medication consumption. So there hasn't been a lot of studies done on the role of taste preferences and medication adherence, especially in kids. Actually, um, I know there's one particular grant that has been funded that it's going to be looking at HIV medication um, and taste preference in children. But there's also other um, applications. If you can think about olfactory, the olfaction, how that is affected when Parkinson's disease, um, smell and taste alterations with depression. So there's many things that you can think of um, in, in studying taste and smell. I particularly became interested in taste working with bariatric surgical patients. So that was one of the primi primary observations that I noticed that sort of led me to kind of wanting to understand more about the system and do this type of work. So there's a lot of questions that could be answered, especially when kids. The methods are a little bit challenging, but they're doable. So a friend of mine here was giving this talk and photoshopped me into this. <laughs> so I figured I would make you laugh. But so one of the things that I would like to say is that, you know, remember a spoonful of sugar might help the medicine go down, but be aware of the metabolic consequences, especially of giving children um, a lot of medications that contain a lot of sweets or when their diets are high in sugar. I thought that was quite funny, so I put it in there. <laughs> but so the other part of, um, that I was tasked to do was talk a little bit about NIH and NINA opportunity. So, we are so close. I feel like most of you guys should be coming down and we should be coming down here and collaborate. Um, so and I, um, as you know, NIH has 27 institute and centers and we're just one of the institutes, NINR. So the mission that we have is to promote uh, and improve health of individuals, families, and communities and to improve quality of life of individuals and their caregivers. And we support both, um, and I now support and conduct clinical and basic research to build a foundation for clinical practice. So the four areas of scientific focus within um, NINR are symptom science, wellness, self-management, end of life and palliative care. And they are two cross-cutting areas of innovation and technology as well as, well as training and career development for nurse scientists. So most of you might be aware of the traditional um, opportunities like the T32s, the F31 for the pre-doctoral level, the post-doctoral, um, the K99, as well as the F31, F32s and T32s and the K awards. However, I think sometimes people are less familiar with the stuff that we do in the intramural program. So we hold... Um, what we call the NINR symptom, um, symptom Methodologies Bootcamp every year. Um, this year is focused on precision health, from omics to data science. We have had one in pain, fatigue, big data. And this is open to the public, it's free, and it's a week long and anyone can really attend. It just fills up really quickly, so I'll encourage you whenever it's open for next year to sign up. Then um, we have the Summer Genetic Institute, which is held every June. It's a one-month intensive training. It's very intense. Um, we have had about over 400 alumni, and then individuals are able to get an eight graduate level credit um, for the education. And I participated in the Summer Genetic Institute while I was doing my PhD at Penn many years ago. It, when I said it's intensive, it's quite intensive, but it's really uh, a great opportunity to be on campus, to find collaborators, to really learn more about genomics, and being able to find ways to apply what you're learning into your program of research. Um, we also have the Graduate Partnership Program, which is for doctoral uh, fellowships, which means that you do your 
PhD in collaboration with the NIH. So you come in and work in one of our labs while you do it, getting your PhD in, in your academic institution. And then we pay for the rest of it. Um, we also have summer internships, um, post back fellowship, again, pre doctoral and post doctoral fellowship. And my advice is reach out to any of the investigators if you're interested and just really ask us any questions. And you feel free to ask me any questions. Um, you can also, again, reach out to any of us and come and do rotations in our lab. If you want to collaborate, that's also possible. If you just want a tour, we're able to do that as well. So there are many different opportunities that I didn't know existed while I was um, in the extramural world before, and I wish I had known more of these opportunities. So um, for those that are interested, this is the um, information for our training director, and she's more than willing to ask, answer any questions. Um, with that, I want to thank you all for listening. And I hope that you learn a little bit about sweet taste and that Mary Poppins wasn't too off <laughs> in terms of adding sugar to help that medicine go down. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Um, I'm very grateful for all my funding and the people that work in my lab. They're fabulous. We are a small lab, but we are very, very busy. And then if you have any questions, feel free to email me or call me. Um, pretty um, available. So does anyone have any questions? I have the mic. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, that was so interesting. Uh, I have a question about the role of the biome beginning in the salivary glands in, in mouth, you know, down through the intestinal tract, because it's so important in breaking down some of the larger molecules, particularly in the food missing in action, right? Fruits and vegetables, um, maybe especially in the vegetables. <laughs> um, and, and that affects taste, right? So the smaller molecules affect taste. And People talk about it for the whole phenolic um, discernment of wines and chocolates and those those polyphenol rich foods, but it's got to be involved in taste for uh, fruits and vegetables up front for kids also. And I wonder what role that plays in their ability to discern. Not the obvious big four that you discussed so um, so well here, but for the appreciation or rejection of the flavors and vegetables? So that's a great question. So I didn't put any work on the data that we have on microbiome uh, and taste just because I'm still working through some of that. And actually part of like the, the LACR award that I received is also to look at the role of the microbiome precisely on those areas that you just mentioned. Um, if you look around for a grant or a study that has done on taste and microbiome, there's really, unless it was published last night, none. <laughs> so I, when, when I say this is a really, um, it's a growing area, and I think there's so much opportunity to be able to, to ask so many questions. And, you know, I'm looking so, you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing is also like very molecular, and, and I feel like there's so, so many things in terms of behavior that also needs to be explored. Um, so if you want to collaborate and <laughs> that's why I'm saying it's like so much of metabolism yeah. quickly becomes circular. Because yeah. if you have cultivated a certain biome that rejects the foods you need to appreciate, food, you know, to create yeah. the biome that, to, to appreciate the foods, it, it, it just gets looped out of control physiologically. So yeah. Yeah, no, I would, I would, like, that's part of what, um, so I'm particularly looking at the oral microbiome, so I'm not looking at, um, a tool. So when we talk about the gut microbiome, I think I'm a little bit biased in what I say. The gut starts in the mouth, 
So we should be looking at the oral microbiome in, a, in relationship when taste. And I'm also looking at the nasal microbiome when smell. And just really trying to see how it may or may not modulate some of this, um, maybe that brain-gut um, connection. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. That was really fabulous. Um, question for you. I, I'm sort of interested in the, the selective advantage uh, through natural history of these early life preferences mm -hmm. for sweets. Mm -hmm. um, it seems a little bit counterintuitive that the body would crave sweets at the expense of the more calorically dense and, and uh, uh, potentially nutritious uh, fats and proteins. Well, what do you think is going on there from a natural selective uh, perspective? So one of the things that we know is that in, from an evolutionary perspective, this is important, right? Like we know that, um, you know, it is fascinating how the, the body of like we have been, we have evolved to be able to taste things that are associated sweet with calories to be able, especially with, with growth and, and development. In terms, and that's a lot of like sort of like the explanation that has been given in terms of like the association when evolution, evolutionarily with sweet taste and growth. Um, in specific, and I think I forgot the second part of your question, which was. Uh, oh, I'm just interested why that developed and, and we didn't develop a preferential taste for fats, which of course are much more calorically dense. Yeah, and actually that's, that's a very good question. Um, you know, and and I really don't know. I, I, I it, and I, and again, it goes back to like the area of this area of time being so novel too, in which we probably don't necessarily know have a lot of these answers yet. Um, we do need more people to do this type of work, um, and I really hope that I have ignited at least some ideas in the room of maybe just doing some pilot studies to be able to look, um, you know, maybe looking at genetic um, predispositions and how that probably have been associated with some of the things. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, thanks for giving us so much information that many of us <clears throat> don't know anything about. Obviously, during chemotherapy, uh, there are changes in taste. Um, I'm wondering, have there been any attempts uh, at looking at whether one can change uh, taste in a benign way uh, as, a, as an approach towards obesity management? In a benign way. Um, so like when an intervention to see what we, what, how we can I mean, modulate. How does, how does it change taste? How, how do, does chemotherapy uh, change taste and are there ways of, of using, um, you know, that, that mechanism uh, as as an appropriate uh, way of, of obesity control. I think that's a great idea. I'm not aware of any studies that have actually done that in trying to maybe look at what happens when chemotherapy and maybe apply it into obesity. I, I think that would be interesting to actually see. The one other thing with cancer is that when, actually I was just finishing this paper, is that you know, at least 50 to 55% of patients from cancer have changes in the way, you know, they complain of the changes of food taste. However, a lot of these are not, have been measured quantitatively. They are self-reports. So some of the studies that are being done right now is to measure more quantitatively to really understand, you know, in what direction. Is it, is it sweet? Is it salty? Is it bitter? What, what exactly are they experiencing? when chemotherapy. And that, it's like, I can count the number of studies that have been done. Most of them have been self-reported. And actually, most of them have been done by nurses, <laughs> which is um, really interesting. But I think it would be fascinating to really understand exactly what's happening to be able to then go back and maybe use something with obesity. I think right now it's too early to try to develop that type of intervention without really understanding what's going on. But again, more ideas. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, everyone.